is amazing. When our next guest was just five years old, she started her own business to make a better life for herself and her family. From Detroit, Michigan, please welcome 11-year-old Asia Newson. Tell us about your story, because we didn't know your story until we looked into it a little further. We were just helping the school. And so you started a business when you were five. How did this come about? Well, I have a company called Super Business Girl, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Super uh, Business uh -huh. Girl. Yeah. And um, Super Business Girl is a company that teaches children how to become entrepreneurs and empower themselves. But I also make and sell my handmade candles. Okay. So you, you uh, how did you get into the candle business? What did you, uh, how did you decide that? Well, my daddy was a candle salesman, mm -hmm. and when I was about four or five years old, I just kind of tagged along, mm -hmm. and he went out, I went out with him, of course, and he sold candles, and he also made candles, and he taught me, and I love it, love it, love it. It opened up a lot of doors for me. It opened up a door to see you. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you're... Well, you're just as cute as can be. Uh, so, so you learned how to make candles, and these are your candles right here. And and is it hard to make a candle? Um, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> and you make them, and you get the jars, and you put them in there. And and is there a secret to selling the candles? Yep. First, speak with conviction. Oh, you know what? Why don't you sell me? <laughs> tell me, sell me this candle. Okay. Excuse me, Ellen. Oh, yes. Hi, how are you? Good, good, fine. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm Asian, I'm an entrepreneur, and the name of my company is Super Business Girl. Mm -hmm. I teach children how to become entrepreneurs. Today I'm not selling my beautiful, beautiful handmade candle because I'm raising money to buy the things I need to expand and grow my business. And I need you to buy one of my candles because you will make a big difference in my business. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Wow. Uh <laughs> How much is that candle? Twenty dollars. It's twenty dollars. <laughs> wow, it's pricey, but okay. That's there's twenty dollars right there. I'll buy that candle. All right. It smells great. Thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Wow, that's so nice. And then you can just put the the top on it if you want to to keep it fresh. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. All right. And so you're gonna go to college, I assume. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, first I'm gonna be lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, a lawyer, and uh -huh. then I'm gonna be mayor of Detroit. And then I'm gonna be president of the United States. I believe you. <laughs> and when you become president of the United States, what is the first order of business for you? Well, I wanna open a big building where it's a lot of homeless people in there. I really want all of the homeless people in the world. I'm trying. Mm -hmm. But it's gonna be a lot of homeless people in there, and I'm gonna have a kitchen, a bedroom, everything that they need to survive in there. And I'm gonna give them $150 a week. And they can come and go whenever they want. And they're gonna be my best friends. And I promise I'm gonna do that. Why can't we do that? And then you started, I mean, you've got so many things going on. At 11 years old, you started a coat drive, right? Yep. Tell everybody about that. Well, a couple of, mo a couple of months ago, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, but a couple of months ago, um, I had a coat drive, and I gave out 150 coats to the needy children in my community. And it really warmed my heart because I saw a lot of smiles on the little children's faces, and it inspired me to do it every year. You are so amazing. For a science fair project, uh, most, most students would make a volcano or a potato light bulb. Uh, my next guest decided to invent a life-saving medical device instead. They're stitches that change color when an infection is detected. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Why? From Iowa City, Iowa, please welcome 17-year-old Daisha Taylor. Daisha! Ellen! <laughs> I mean, come on. What How does this come? Okay, so... You, you're, you're smart, obviously. Kinda. You've done other things that probably we, we should talk about as well, but we're just gonna focus on this, because clearly you've done something before this. So you're doing this, this project. How do you come up with this idea? And how'd you, how'd you make it happen? Well, um, it all started when my science teacher, also mentor, Carolyn Walling, approached the entire chemistry class and said that, hey, you can conduct research throughout the entire school year, and enter it in a science fair at the end of the school year and win some money, do all the things. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I need to jump on that. So a couple weeks later, I was reading an article where these scientists made these really fancy stitches that could do all these things and use this very expensive technology. And I was like, well, 
the people who could actually use that and actually need it won't be able to afford it because of all this fancy technology. So I set out to create cost-effective sutures that change color when an infection is present, and hey, now I'm here with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it, is it like a mood ring where, like, how, okay, so how do the stitches detect to, what happens? How does that work? So this is where the science happens. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. I mean, I'm not gonna understand, but I'm ready. <laughs> I'll try my best. So um, when our skin is healthy, it's naturally acidic. So it has around a pH of five. But when our wounds are infected, that pH increases to about eight or higher. So, like, that's, that's as science as it gets. Okay, okay <laughs> so in order to make the stitches change color, I need what, what's called a natural indicator, which essentially is a substance that changes color when the pH changes. In my case, I found beets of all things. I don't like beets, I hate beets, <laughs> I don't eat beets or anything. <laughs> but I found that they change color at the pH of nine, which is perfect for that infection. So I just put those two principles together and I created color changing stitches. <laughs> wow. You can make stitches out of beets? Yes. <laughs> How, do you, how did you even know that you could make stitches out of beets? Well, like I said, I just put those principles together, so I can't say too much because I am seeking a patent for my invention. Yeah, so, so <laughs> yes, so you're seeking a patent so that, I mean, because people need these right away. Yeah. How long does it take to get a patent for that? So I'm not sure of the timeline specifically, but I definitely won't stop until the people who need these stitches actually get them. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that would be a no-brainer. Like, yes, here's the patent. Right, You know, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm gonna say, get a patent for <laughs> this young lady. One of the many victims of the pandemic has been local, small locally owned businesses. So right now we're gonna surprise Alicia from Kansas City, Missouri. She's a small business owner who's used up her savings to help keep her store from closing. Even though she's struggled, Alicia has continued to help her community. All right, let's go. Alicia. Alicia. Hi, Alicia. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. How are you? Hey, hey. <laughs> Hi. That's so pretty where you are. What's behind you? That's like a flowers, pretty wall. Yeah, that's my rose wall that I made for my shop. <laughs> I like it. You own a small business. It's called Unleashed. Tell us, I, I know about it, but tell everybody about it. Yes, so I am the owner of Unleashed Plus Size Resale in Kansas City, Missouri. We are the only secondhand shop in Kansas City that caters to plus size women. Uh, we have sizes 14 and up, and our main goal is to help build community, build confidence, and build self-love amongst plus size women in KC and beyond. Yes. So, very cool. I know, and I'm also, I love thrift shops. I mean, it's so much fun because you never know what you're gonna find. I understand that sort of was your passion. You always went thrift shopping and then you wanted to do this, right? Yes, I love, love, love thrifting. I always went thrifting when I was young. I always loved fashion. My grandma took me to my first thrift shop when I was um, in third grade. Um, and I was like really excited when I got there. The clothes fit my body and then as well, um, it was cheap. Like we were poor so I could get 10 items for $10 and I was like, yes, this is perfect for me. <laughs> so why did you decide to open up a shop in, the, in this particular neighborhood? Yeah, in this neighborhood for sure, it's very similar to the neighborhood that I grow up, grew up in. We were in the inner city, um, and I think in this neighborhood, it's important for like young black kids to see a uh, black owned business that's still like really nice and they can aspire to have that for themselves as well. And to try to combat some of the gentrification that is going on here on this main street. Yeah. Good for you, that's yeah. fantastic. So you open up your storefront, one month later the pandemic hit. I mean. That it's it must have been so exciting for you to finally have your 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 business, and then a month later, I mean that that had to really hurt. Absolutely, like um, I know COVID is hard for like everyone right now, but like I was so excited to open. We were supposed to open on March 15th and March 14th. They said you know everything has shut down. Um, so at that point, like we were not making any money. So I'm going in like savings, trying to pay for bills to keep us open. Um, but I knew I had to do it. It was important to like keep us open and like lean on the community because um, that's what it's all about, like giving back to the community. It is what it's all about. And what's amazing is that even though you're at risk of losing your shop, closing down, you still find ways to give back. 
Absolutely. Like for me growing up, there were like many different people who gave back to me from my hairstylist who did like half off Tuesdays for me to get my hair done. Like, I think it's my purpose here in the community to do the same thing. Um, over the summer when the protests were going on, we raised over a thousand dollars to make care packages for protesters and the rest of the money we gave to a local trans organization and helped out black teachers. Let's go. Fantastic. Our next guests are an inspiring father and daughter who came together to create a very cool app that benefits thousands of families. From Atlanta, Georgia, please welcome Antoine Patton and his daughter, JJ. Hi. This is, this is fantastic. When my producers told me about y'all, we're like all so impressed by <laughs> everything. You. So Antoine, tell us uh, the story. Tell us how it all started. Yes, JJ and I, we started an organization called Photo Patch Foundation. And what it does is it helps kids who have a mom or dad in prison stay connected. So kids can use our system to send letters and photos to their moms or dad in prison. We actually started this out of necessity because when I was about 20 years old and JJ was just three, I went to prison um, and it was very devastating. For what reason? Uh, criminal possession of a weapon. So you had a weapon on you. You weren't committing a crime, but you had a weapon on you and you went to jail for how long? About seven years, but I was sentenced to eight years. Wow, okay. So you find yourself in prison and like, and you're three years old. Yes. You were trying to write letters. You were yes. trying to help her with homework even all through that yes. time, yes. right? Yes. 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 Yeah, I was super inspired by JJ's letters. Um, as you can imagine, I was, I was broken. I felt like, you know what, I wanted to be redeemed in my family's eyes, especially my young daughter. So she would send me these letters and photos, send her homework, and we would communicate as much as possible. But JJ needed the help of an adult to send letters, to get pictures printed, to get stamps. So um, I got really motivated while in prison and said, you know what, I want to do something different. I want to build something that makes it more convenient for families to stay connected. Right. So, so you taught yourself how to code. Yes, yes. I mean, crazy. Yes. So <laughs> I, I, it's so foreign to me. I don't understand it at all. <laughs> all right. So you teach yourself to code while you're in prison. And you, you built then, then you, when you got out of prison, you learned how to code. Yes, so when he came home from prison, he was always on his computer, always doing this cool looking thing. And I wanted to build a bond with him. I wanted to do whatever he was doing. So I'm like, hey dad, maybe you can teach me this and you know, I can learn it as well. So he taught me and it was just a great bonding moment. But as my skills got more and more better, I realized, hey, we, like, we need an app for this. We need an app for Photo Patch because I knew how much more convenient it will be. Kids nowadays are using phones more and more. So I built the app when I was 12. We launched it all for free, easy to use. We even got a testimonial once from a five-year-old kid. He used the text-to-speech to use it. And he thanked us for how well he was able to use it to communicate with his parents. And how many families, it's amazing, how many families have you connected now? Well, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, so we launched Photo Patch Foundation in 2015. In our first year, we helped 2,500 families get connected. Once JJ built the app, it skyrocketed. It's, yes. But then, to date, we've helped about 70,000 uh, families stay connected, and we sent over a million photos to prisons around the nation. Wow. Um, so you... And you have a school where you're helping teachers teach uh, students how to code. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're actually teachers, so... Tech changed our lives so much, learning how to code and knowing how to build websites and apps. Such a powerful skill. So JJ and I started our own online school called the Unlock Academy. And our mission was to help 2,020 people learn how to code by 2020. Within the first year, we actually taught 4,500 people how to code. And to date, we taught over 8,000 people how to code. <laughs> Amazing. So what's next now? What's the next thing you're doing? Yeah, so right now I'm on a mission to help 10,000 girls of color get into the world of tech and start their career path. Um, just for me, like, there's not much representation of people who look like me in the world in, of tech. And I know other little girls want to get into this world, but they don't see that they can do it. So I want to be that guide and help them do it and just start them off with their career. So we have, I actually have a scholarship fund as well that we're raising awareness to help these women and girls start their career and just let them know that they can do it. Good for you. Good Thank for you. you. <laughs> when I was 18 years old, I was selling vacuum cleaners. And at the same age, our next guest has already developed a potential treatment for breast cancer. Her name is Sarah Sakowitz. Sarah, come on down, where are you? You're 18 years old and you're working on a treat. So how, do, you're a college student, right? I am. And, and so how did this come up that, uh, <laughs> that you're working on this? 
So my friends kind of, they tell me I've lived this crazy double life because by day, I'm a freshman at Columbia uh, right. studying biomedical engineering. And then at night, <laughs> I guess when everyone else is going to frat parties, I'm going to my cancer research lab, putting on a lab coat, and, um, and, and researching breast cancer. Wow. And do you have someone in your family that you did? What, what sparked this? So when I was nine, my cousin died from breast cancer. And that was really the first time I had ever, um, I think, encountered death so close to my family. And uh, I, I felt the impact it had on everyone around me. And um, science was already big in my life. And I, I thought I needed to understand, really, the science behind cancer to get past, I guess, the shock. Um, and then when I turned 16, I started at my first cancer research lab. Um, and that was kind of the beginning. Wow, it's amazing. So you were just drawn to this. And how does your treatment work? So basically, uh, everyone has genes. And genes are kind of like on-off switches. Um, and against cancer, genes can actually act like an army. So everyone has genes that can prevent the block uh, or prevent the spread of cancer. But when cancer, or when cancer starts, um, a lot of these genes are actually switched off. So they're turned off. Um, and so from the very beginning, uh, what I've been working to do is turn on these important anti-cancer genes. Um, and what my, my treatment or therapy does is actually prevent the silencing of those genes in the first place. Um, so the hope is that it can prevent the progression of, of cancer. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. That's <laughs> so could it, is this just for breast cancer? Could this work for any and all cancer, or, or <laughs> a ca different cancer is treated in different ways? So um, the most exciting part of my research, I think, is that um, whereas other therapies have focused on you know specific elements of specific cancers, um, my the mechanism that underlies my therapy is not only found in breast cancer; it's found in everything from lung cancer to colon cancer. Um, and the chemical that I actually I, I use to block the pathway in the first place was first introduced in a different type of cancer, lymphoma. Um, so I'm really hoping that, uh, that this type of therapy can be extended from lymphoma to breast cancer to many other types of cancers, Sarah, too. Sarah, good for you. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing what you're doing. 18 years old. You are changing the world. Thank you. Our next guest is just your typical teenager. You know, the kind that's been running a successful business all while being a full-time ninth grader. So, yeah, typical. <laughs> from Hermitage, Tennessee, please welcome Kiara Perkins. Yeah. Hey, it's so great to meet you. It is. I love watching you, Ellen, and your wife dance, and I'm so excited to be here. This is like my biggest dream to come on here, so thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Honestly, the pleasure is all ours, and we're so excited that you are here, and especially, I mean, listen, I've, I've, I've said this over and over in the show, but you're here for the Father's Day show, so this is really special and special to have you here because uh, this company that you started, you actually uh, started this because of Father's Day, Candles by Kiera, right? Yes, sir. I wanted to do something different for my dad for Father's Day, and I just didn't want to give him, like, candy or buy him a card. <laughs> so I've, uh, I was like, I, mean, I want thought of dad's two favorite things, which are candles and chocolate chip cookies. And when I mean he loves chocolate chip cookies, we would sneak down in the middle of the night and bake cookies and not tell mom, so I'm so sorry, mom. <laughs> And so I was like, so I put the two together and I was like, hey, and I made the chocolate chip cookies and milk candle. Mom took a picture of me and she posted it on Facebook and it went viral. And I was like, hey, mom, I can start a candle business. That's incredible. <laughs> I love that. And, and, you, and you did. And you sent some of your best selling candles here. So look, just talk, talk to me about some the way that you designed some of these, because this is amazing. Like this, it looks like I, I should be able to eat this. And obviously I'm not going to, but like this looks, <laughs> this looks delicious. Tell us about this. <laughs> That's my strawberry blast shake candle. That one's my favorite. It smells like fresh strawberries. Yes. That's a real, that's not a real ice cream, but I used the ice cream scoop to make the ice cream on top of it. Uh -huh. And I wanted to make a shake candle. I was like, what's not, uh, what's better than a strawberry shake? Absolutely. Now, what about this? What about this one right here? Look at this, y'all. Isn't this amazing? Look at this. <laughs> that's the pineapple explosion. I released that candle a few weeks ago, and it's becoming my top seller. I was looking for a pineapple scent because pineapple, my, my dad's favorite fruit are pineapples. Okay, cool. Let's do it here. Let's do one more. Look, and this, uh, so this was, is this the one that started it all, the, co the, the cookies and milk one? 
Yes, sir. That's the chocolate chip cookies and milk candle. And you see the cookie sitting there? Absolutely. My dad thought it was a real cookie, so he tried to pull the cookie out <laughs> until he saw the wood. That's amazing. This is incredible, Kiara. And it's been three years since you started your candle business. And obviously, you got the designs on lock, the smells and all that. How has business been going so far? It's been doing great. Uh, I had to stop. I used to do a lot of craft shows when I first started my business. Now I don't do as much as I used to because of COVID, but my mm -hmm. online orders have picked up and I sold over thousands of candles. Mm -hmm. And I feel really proud of myself. I, my, my English and my math skills, math skills have improved so much and I'm not on my phone all day. And plus I can save money for college. I love that. And what's crazy is that you, you make it sound super easy. Like you're, you're balancing uh, school and also like being a CEO. Like how, I mean, how are you doing this? I have a very busy schedule mm -hmm. uh, doing schoolwork, mm -hmm. making candles, uh, practicing volleyball, and driving a junior dress or race car. But my mom taught me something called time management. Now I'm able right. to have a balanced schedule. And, and also, sorry, did you say something about racing cars just now? <laughs> yes, sir. I drive, a, I drive a junior dress or race car. It's a car that goes 75 miles per hour for an eighth of a mile. And I have a Spider-Man car. So people usually think it's a boy when I'm driving my car until I take my helmet off. They're like, oh, it's a girl. <laughs> you know, this, you're incredible. You're incredible. And we have to take a break. Thank but before you. we go to break, I just, I just, uh, can you tell us the motto that you came up with to inspire other kids? We got to hear that before we go to break. I tell kids that a young creative mind can grow in business and you do not have to wait till you're an adult to achieve your goals. Clap for that. Like that's, uh, you are incredible, incredible.